Okay. Uh, so, um, hello everyone. Um, welcome. It's lovely to see so many people uh, joining us on this Zoom chat. Um, what I'm going to do before I introduce our, our um, speaker to you again um, is just give a little bit of housekeeping quickly. Um, so at the moment, um, you're all muted, um, and if you wouldn't mind um, keeping your videos off as well, um, unless you're speaking, this just ensures that um, we have good quality sound um, and that that kind of remains good. So you'll see the, the hosts, um, uh, Taylor and myself and um, Janet, Todd, obviously. Um, you'll see them, uh, but yes, uh, the rest of us uh, will remain kind of off for a while. Um, and then what we'd like to do is invite Christian um, uh, for, for Jan Todd. Um, so you can either ask a question by typing in the chat box um, and then we can read it out or we can unmute you. Alternatively, you can raise your hand as well um, and you can do this by going to, there's a bar at the bottom of your screen and you can see a, a button that says participant. If you click that and then next to yourself you should have the option to select more um, and then you should be able to raise your hand. So if you pop your hand up then we'll, um, we'll go to you and, and let you ask your questions. Um, so hopefully you've all had a chance to watch um, Jan's uh, wonderful extracts from her new novel, Don't You Know There's a War On. Um, as many of you will know, um, Janet's husband, internationally recognised uh, scholar and novelist, and she's very well known for her works on Austin, um, on Afro Ben, and on Mary Wollstonecraft as well. Um, and she's had a lot to do with Shorten House over the years. Um, her work I've had recourse to over and over again in my studies, and I'm sure many of you who are academics uh, feel the same. But more recently, she's turned her hand to novels. Um, so Lady Susan Chase again came out in 2013, A Man of Genius in 2016, um, and her new novel as well, which I'm sure we're all um, dying to read. Um, we got some tantalising snapshots of it in Dan's wonderful um, recorded talk. And if you've enjoyed this, you can buy the book on Amazon. There's a link to, um, to where you can get it on our programme on the Shorten House website. Um, so I'd, I'm going to um, invite questions, um, and while you're all kind of warming up, um, I, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, abuse my position as chair and, and ask mine first. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested um, in this new uh, kind of heroine, um, Jan. You, you talked about it, um, the, the focus is on a mother, not a daughter, and a mother that we might think of as, um, as kind of monstrous in some ways as well. Um, your comments about Joan kind of called to mind often saying, you know, I have a heroine who um, uh, nobody except myself or much like. Um, and of course, you know, we know from reading 18th century literature that mothers are often kind of not featured. Um, I think Marilyn Frankis has written about that. So I wonder um, whether maybe you could say a little bit about um, the influence you took from the work you've done before on 18th century women writers um, on the writing of this novel. You know, was there a sense in which you brought anything from that period into the writing itself? Well, first let me say thank you to so many people for showing up on what is a wonderfully bright day out there. So I'm, I'm awfully grateful. Um, well, it's always difficult to say that you're influenced by Jane Austen. It seems so, so sort of incredibly pompous because she's so wonderful. Um, but I actually have always been impressed by her notion. Well, first of all, she thought she was writing, um, creating a character in Emma. Um, whom nobody would like, but in fact the one that people do not like on the whole is Fanny Price. And I find Fanny Price a very interesting character. I don't like her either, but I really find her more fascinating than any of the others. So I think that I do get from Austin this interest in those who are not universally attractive. Um, and I do think that's that's been an influence. And um, I do think there's a there's a way in which we want our heroines to be nice in all sides. And I mean, I, it was interesting, I, I wrote a biography of Mary Wollstonecraft, who I admire totally. I think she's an extraordinary woman. Well, now everybody does, but when I first started writing on her, she wasn't really terribly known. And so I felt, I suppose, that I've almost known her, um, which is, is, again, extremely presumptuous. But um, she too, had a, a, a difficult side. Um, I spent a lot of time with her sisters and she was, she was very dominating, she was very controlling. Um, and she also, while loving her little Fanny hugely, she found motherhood something of a chore. And she once says, well, I, I don't want to be a slave to the child. So I think 
I took a little something from that. I think that my Wollstonecraft was perhaps a little, little tartar than the ones um, written about in some other biographies, but I think I took that from Mary Wollstonecraft, that sort of um, slight irritation at the demands of motherhood. But essentially, it's such a different period. Um, it's except that one could say that the Regency period, which is where I wrote most of my um, earlier academic stuff, um, is, is a period of change, but what, what period isn't? But I do think in, in terms of cultural change, of, of needing to think differently, that though that period of the 60s and 70s is really quite extraordinary. So I wanted to set a, a, a book in that period, but also to see it from somebody who couldn't make the changes, who simply could not adapt, who insisted on being an outsider as the world moved on and changed. Mm. I, I don't know if that answers your question. But <laughs> no, no you, no, you really have. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, that idea of, um, of the kind of, you know, the, the, the kind of real women, the women who do find, um, uh, you know, the sort of chores of life very frustrating is, is something that I think many of us can, can relate to. Um, and also, I mean, this, this idea of the, the period being a period of, of, of great change. I mean, you said that there aren't kind of that, you know, there aren't sort of correlations so much now. But I, I do wonder whether, you know, perhaps um, there might be many people um, kind of similar to Joan who do feel kind of disaffected by, um, what, by what's happening right now. Um, and so, I, you know, I wonder whether the, the present moment did also kind of find its way into what you were, um, what you were writing. Um, I, wonder, I mean, what sort of research did you do? I wrote it a long time. But the trouble is, it, it's like everything else in my life. I'm, I'm so old now that everything I've been doing has been being done for a very long time. And since I always wanted to be a novelist, um, and yet thought I ought, as a single parent, I thought I ought to earn a proper living uh, through being an academic, I started loads of books and then put them aside. And some of them became outdated. I wrote books in Ghana and so on that were totally out of the question now that the world has changed so much. But this one I started when I, I was out of England between um, what mid sixties to the mid eighties. And I kept coming back with my new ideas, with my ideas of feminism, my ideas of how history was rewritten. And um, I found that so many people in England had not changed, that these, they had, they, they had, they will change and they do in the end, but, on the whole, they were holding back. And I was very intrigued by this. Um, and I found that now looking back on myself, I was rather bumptious about talking to women of my mother's generation, which is more, which is um, Joan's generation, and thinking that they should move with me. I had at that point, I think, the enormous condescension of the present. And now that I'm old, I'm looking at the young who have that enormous condescension towards me, um, people say, make remarks like, well, um, you know, as a second wave feminist, what do you think? And you think, well, second wave? I thought there was just feminism. I thought <laughs> that's what there was. How many waves are we? Um, and so on. So I, I, I think it's come, I didn't have to do a lot of research, in other words, because the book started a long time ago. I put it away and then I finished it fairly recently, well, obviously in the last year or so. Um, so it has nothing to do clearly with, um, uh, with our lockdown situation. But I do think that this claustrophobia of being in a house, um, to me, must have some resonance with what is happening. Um, and I think some of our, the emphasis on doing things, um, on housework, on being more thrifty, perhaps, with food than we used to be, being... Um, more into the little the crafts of mending and sewing and so on. I think, you know, I think there are little ways one might bring the two together. But the period after the war of rationing, which I remember very vaguely, I was obviously very young at the time, um, was so much more austere than it is for most of us comfortable people now, though I recognize that for many people on the breadline it's it's still very awful. But on the whole, with all these zooms and and media and um, shops open at all times. You know, they, there's just more food, there's more everything around than there was at that time. And I think it's hard to remember or to really to 
understand just how austere and pinched and colourless the world in England was after the Second World War. And they'd done all that. They'd won the damn thing. And they wanted more of a reward for it. I mean, it's quite different if you hadn't. I think, you know, the Germans pulled themselves up far more quickly than we did and got on with the new world, made the changes. But I think a lot of people in England found it very hard, people of my parents' generation, just as they found it hard having been brought up with all that patriotism of the empire, that you were doing good to the world, that it was of value, you were bringing commerce and, and, and democracy and so on. All that had to be shifted out. They were to change their views. And so I was trying to catch somebody who just couldn't do that, just as she couldn't keep changing the names of things. She couldn't call the third programme Radio 3. She couldn't do the new money. She didn't want to do it. She wanted to live in her head, and her head had been created in a previous period. I think that's really interesting. And it, it certainly kind of helps, I guess, explain the modern moment too, in some ways. Um, I just think we've got a, a question um, from Laurie and Scott. So I'm just going to um, ask them to start their video and unmute them. Um, Laurie, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, can you hear me? hello. Hi. <laughs> I apologize for my, it sounds like very noisy here because it's just the chimney of my fireplace that <laughs> makes a lot of noise. Um, I loved, loved the details in the passages that you read. Well, I, thank you, I really appreciate that. I, I lead a a girls club and we do a unit on rationing and um, the, the war and and I've never thought of the swish that's missing when you cross your legs because you have no stockings on that all of that that was brilliant and and the the disaster at the sugar factory, my goodness, how, I mean, that's so vivid. Um, and all of those details would carry me through reading your book. I want to know, how do you make um, Joan endearing at the same time? Because a class I took in Oxford once, which has informed all my writing and all my teaching is, um, my professor said, as Graham Greene said to me, people are not black and white, they're black and gray. And so he talked about Shakespeare's um, two thirds characters that their Ophelia is one is the fair Ophelia, but she's also singing body songs. Mm -hmm. But you need both of the good, you know, the good and the bad in yeah. order to care. Agree. Yeah, you're right. I, Mary sure. Crawford. We we love Mary Crawford, and we talk about Mary Crawford endlessly. Aunt Norris, who is, you know, you can name Filch can name her his cat after Aunt Norris, but she's a very one one sided cardboard character because she always chooses the bad choice. So how do you make me love her too? Well, I'd love to talk about Mrs. Norris, but I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my book, but I'd love to discuss that with you. But <clears throat> I don't think she is ever endearing. I want, I mean, you know that, that phrase, you, you want um, to persuade someone to walk in another person's shoes and then they understand them. I want somebody to put her shoes on and try to work out why she's wearing shoes that pinch. So in, I suppose it's, I want people to cognitively be interested in her rather than emotionally. I don't think you can like her, but I hope that she's vital enough and humorous enough sometimes, self-mocking enough um, to be interesting if not pleasant company for the duration. So 
I mean, it was a bit of a risk, but I thought at my age, if I don't take a risk trying to write something, then, then it's rather a pity. I want, I'm not sure I would have done this years ago if I had wanted to uh, write a bestseller, which I'm sure I couldn't have done anyway, but it's, it's something I wanted to do, try to make somebody else understand, get under the skin of somebody who is not likable and knows it, um, and who is a misfit. I mean, I think there's, um, yes, I suppose one should like the characters in, to some extent, but you also have what you want to write about. I mean, there is a, there's a, a sentence where um, Philip Larkin says of um, deprivation, that deprivation is to him what you know daffodils are to Wordsworth. Well, I think misfittery or whatever the word would be, outsiderness is to me what deprivation was to Larkin. I want to know about people who don't fit in, who are outsiders, who are so eccentric that they're not endearing, and to whom, for whom we have very, very little tolerance. I think that our age, which regards itself as incredibly tolerant, is really quite intolerant of intolerance, if I can put it like that. Intolerant of people who think differently from us. Um, and I wanted to create, try to create such a person um, and let her speak in her own voice. Well, somebody who was interviewing me some time ago in, from the state said that um, she thought that my, the vocabulary I gave Joan was too elaborate, too educated, um, and so on. And I, too rich, I suppose. Um, and I don't think it is because she's an autodidact. She's somebody who has read and read and got a very large vocabulary, which is not usable. She doesn't speak it. She can't talk like that. She can only write. Um, and I think that's so true of so many uneducated, um, intellectual, lower middle class people. Um, they are not sure how to pronounce certain words. They're not sure how to behave in certain situations. And you have that awful you and non-you um, distinction between what you say and what the upper middle class says and then what the lower classes say. And so they're so embarrassed sometimes to open their mouths that they say nothing, but or they say something sharp as she does. But she has herself a very rich vocabulary. Um, at the same time, as the, time, as the book goes on, I hope what I've tried to do is suggest that she, she uses more and more words, but she also brings out more. I mean, she is of that generation that does not believe in psychoanalysis or therapy or letting it all hang out. She thinks that if something awful has happened to you, then it is unalterable. You can't get rid of it, you can't change it. It has happened and she stays with it. And she feels the only way forward is to repress it keep it down. And by writing, by using her wider vocabulary, she starts to let it out. And that self-expression um, starts to engulf her and of course, engulfs her daughter as well. And then when you put that all in the context of being shut claustrophobically in a house that she particularly hates, but which she's kept up as a sort of shrine to her own memory, um, then I think you have the, at least I hope, to one had the, um, all the ingredients for a rather difficult ending. Thank you, Jan. Um, we've got another um, comment from uh, Devani, who um, I'm going to unmute her audio so that she can speak to you um, directly. Uh, Devani, are you there? I am here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, it's it's great to be here. My question, Jan, was Hello. it's not going to be as eloquent. Hi, good good to uh, good to hear you. Good to see you. Thank you for that beautiful reading. Well, I'm wondering you. if I tried to get into your Q and A, but I'm so hopeless technologically. But here you are. I see. Oh no, I don't see you. You've gone. I'm I'm going to try to uh, move myself in here. You come back. Here we are. <laughs> not looking nearly as glamorous yeah. as you are. Uh, oh, yes, I'm wondering if <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't, uh, I wasn't planning to, to uh, come on camera. I would love to hear you talk about being a critic and uh, all of the other kinds of writing, all the genres you worked in, biography, memoir, novelist. How do you, 
how do you feel about moving from one to the other? How do they enrich each other? When you were speaking of Wollstonecraft, that was very clear. And I guess I'm just asking you to elaborate on, on that. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Lorraine. Lovely to see you. Um, I, as I said, I always wanted to be a novelist and I, it, it's always been pushing against things. And in fact, um, I mean, I've had some nice reviews for my um, biographies, but of course, one always remembers the rather snarling ones. And one said that, um, that really I ought to be a novelist. <laughs> that I'm clearly getting so much into the, um, into the lives of my characters that I'm almost inventing. And I think that is what I was sort of do, doing. I mean, I did um, criticism in the beginning um, when I was doing, um, I, I wrote a book called um, Women's Friendship in Literature, which was very much criticism without any biography on the edge and the kind of thing that we were supposed to do in the 1970s. That's how you got on and got a job. Um, but after that, I started getting into lives um, when I started the Mary Wollstonecraft newsletter in 1970, my God, it's so far away. Um, I wanted people to write in about lives of, of early women writers. Um, they could write what they wanted, but I, I wanted to know what they did, you know, how they got on, how they made their money, how they were, what they felt when they were disappointed and when they failed and so on. Um, so I think I've always been interested in lives. Um, and that interest, which is a novelettish one, really, because once you start going in a bit, once you start imagining what they thought, then you're, you're in the novel territory, unless they've kept a, a wonderful diary. And even then, it's not quite the same. Um, so I think I've always been a novelist manke and moving more and more into it. Um, I tend also to, to write a lot and then have to pare it down and down and down until I've got something. So that, um, again, I think that I wrote more that would, might now be called, I think it'd be quite acceptable, some of it now, more imaginative um, in that critical and um, creative way that people now write. I wrote a lot like that and then always got rid of it before I sent the work to the press. So I think that, the, that they all go together fairly well. What I was never very good at was sort of um, theoretical criticism or of the sort that was very, very um, popular before, um, well, in the, very much in the 1970s when I, when I was first working. Um, happily, feminism came along and feminism allowed one to do all sorts of different things like dig out women writers and that's been my life. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That's beautiful. You do any. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Roz Ballaster now, so I'm going to unmute you. Ah. Hello, Roz. Hello. Hello, uh, Roz. Hi, I'm trying to make myself visible. Hang on. Oh, yes, could you? I'd really rather I see just, you. Oh, thank oh, you. you. to start your video. <laughs> there you go. Hi. There you are. Hi, Roz. Hi, Jan. <laughs> Jan inspired my thesis, so we were old. We go back. <laughs> old chatters. Um, I was so fascinated by your, um, what you were talking about, about your character. Jan, and, and this debate about anger and exclusion, and clearly, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're right, anger and exclusion doesn't make people attractive. <laughs> it just makes them angry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and trying to represent that is quite challenging. And I, energetic, I, though. I think it makes them energetic. I suppose I was wondering about a sort of sense of competing claims around anger and the generational competing claims that you're clearly dramatizing in this novel. It seems to me often fiction, um, the, the gothic or the kind of house novel or the thriller novel often allows that anger to get expressed through the the space or the place you know that it expresses that anger you're clearly it sounds like this novel is is not a gothic novel it's a, no. a novel whatever that means and i suppose i'm trying to think about uh, did, did you have to think about how you allowed uh, other people's anger at the kind of wreckage that your character or angry characters clearly implement as they go along without being able to acknowledge or recognize how do you allow do you did you feel you had a responsibility to voice that or did you worry about that or do you just think that's not what this novel is doing? Well, i suppose I, I'm about maud here <laughs> what's yes, maud? quite quite <laughs> well i'm of maud's generation so yeah. it, it, it the, the one i'm the joan who has the voice mm. um it, is is my parents generation and i I know that I could have given Maud more of a voice, but I, I absolutely didn't want to because 
otherwise she would swamp, <laughs> swamp the mother. Because in so many books, it is from the daughter's point of view. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful books talking about the horrors of um, the way women of the 40s and 50s brought up children. Mm -hmm. um, there were, you, you, as you probably know, the, the, the idea of upbringing um, based on Truby King's idea that you, you, you deliver self-control through control of the child, and that way you make a, a self-controlled and good adult. It was a very harsh upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the daughters who are writing the books about such mothers are angry that they now believing in Spock and much more indulgence of children. Mm -hmm. um, they're angry that they were subjected to that. So again, I thought, I'd like to hear the mother's voice. I want to hear the voice of the woman who thought she was doing, in, at least in the upbringing, and she's angry in other ways, obviously, and does put that anger and her bitterness onto her daughter. But her upbringing is in tune and in line with the um, ideas of upbringing of the 1940s. Mm. You know, the very quick early toilet train, everything being had to be done then. And I think, again, you have to remember this period. It was after the war, women were thrown out of the workplace, back at home, um, nurseries were closed. Mm. Um, and there was nowhere where she could escape into the kind of life she wanted. And she went according to the book. She thought that this is how she should bring up a girl. Um, and she gave her in the end, the education that she wanted. Now, of course, what she wanted was to live through the daughter. And because the daughter did not have the results of that education. I mean, so many, just a detour, so many people of that generation of my mother's generation thought that Edu uh, um, university education would give you not only a better position in life, but would move you into the upper middle class mm. from the lower, mm. and probably make you a rather good marriage. Mm. Well, the, um, my character Joan has some of those feelings and she's deeply disappointed. Now one should say that a mother should not try to live through the children. But again, I think that is what she does and her disappointment is meted on the child who fails to be what she thinks she would have been. So yes, it's not right. Um, but if I felt I wanted still to try to understand her, and I can still come back to that. I wanted to understand that generation of mothers who thought in what looks to, looks to me considerable cruelty and coldness and distance thought they were doing the right mm. thing. Does that answer it? Well, no, I'm sure it does. I mean, I suppose what I think, I mean, it's a kind of interesting cho choice to, to leave that as though, in, in a way that makes the anger present as something that's not expressed, but acknowledged as legitimate. <laughs> well, I wanted it to be legitimate. I, nobody's going to like her, but I just want them to say, well, gosh, um, there was a vitality that has been snuffed out. Now, the fact that she, as she goes into her, sort of, as she collapses, she take, tries to take her daughter with her, then that is appalling. Mm. At the same time, her collapse, I hope, is understandable, if not, again, if not engaging, if not endearing. Um, also, I think the, the other thing I just wanted to stress about, it, slightly off the point, though, is, is the huge ignorance of that generation, mm. and we talk quite late. Um, about sexual matters um, and about other things. There wasn't much discussion of, of what it was to be a mother, what it was to give birth, or all the things that we talk about now quite, quite openly. And I wanted to give the sense that if you had in your womb some, something growing that is not what you want and that is appalling and can destroy you and that you cannot get rid of and that maybe may be being influenced by your thoughts and maybe responding to your hatred of it. What on earth do you do? That may be a bit gothic, actually. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I fell on that um, on that rather gothic note. Um, we are sadly going to have to wrap up. It's it's yeah, 
really sad to have to cut this conversation short, but I hope... <laughs> I'm sorry I stopped on that. I'd like to say something. She does have a, a sense of humour, let me tell you quickly. She does talk to her, uh, her, her new appliances as though they were people and she enjoys their conversation. They, they have rather lower, lower class voices and she, she sort of imagines these conversations along with them. So I hope that there is a little humour in it too. I think something of that certainly comes across in the second extract that you read, uh, talking about the radiated uncle. Um, but uh, on that note, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap it up. So, Jan, thank you so much for joining us and so generously sharing um, those wonderful extracts in your novel. As I said, um, the novel is available to buy on Amazon. There's a link um, on our um, uh, on our program on our website. Um, so I hope everyone will um, will say thank you very much to Jen and um, then join Gillian Dow when she talks about John Murray the second and his woman life next. So thank, thank you, you very so much, much for, for being with us. Thank Pleasure you. Jen. Be here. Thank so you. Tom, may I ask you a question before you go? Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time now, so we're, we're going to shut the meeting now. Okay. Okay. Bye bye, bye everybody. everybody. Thank you.